actually continuing a discussion of the Mishnah. Yeah. And we'll just start from the bottom of Daf Yutes Amid Beis, because Rava yeah. is trying to clarify what the machlokis between the Chachamim and Rebbe Eliezer is yes. in our Mishnah. The Mishnah had talked about a machatzeles kanim gedola. If you have a mat mm-hmm. of reeds, which is large, uh, then the Mishnah had said that according to the Tanakama, if you make it for sleeping or for lying on, so then it is subject to tumah because it's a kli. If it's if if um, uh, if it's made for schach, so then uh, you're allowed to use it as schach. The Gemara's question is that there's a middle ground here, which is what if you manufacture it without any particular designation? It's not clear what the Chachamim hold. Also, it's not clear what Rabbi Eliezer says. Rabbi Eliezer says it makes no difference whether it's large or small. And he says whether if you make it for lying, so then it is Makabal Tumah. If you don't make it for lying, but rather you make it for Schach, it is not Makabal Tumah. So what is the point of disagreement? So we're up to Amar Rava, or Ella Amar Rava, Begidola Kuli Amalo Pligi When we're dealing with a large mat, Everyone agrees that if you manufacture it without any particular designation, then the assumption is is that it's meant for schach, because you're not going to use such a large mat for sleeping or or resting on. Kipligi biketana. The machlokis is when you have a small mat, and it's made without any particular designation. Tanakama sover ketana l'shechiva, v'rebi Eliezer sover stam ketana nomi l'sichach. The Tanakama says that a small mat, when it's not manufactured with any designation, the assumption is, is that it's for sleeping, and therefore it's makabal tuma. Rebbe Eliezer says, no. Um, Rabbi, could you close the door, please? Sorry. And Rebbe Eliezer says, no. We assume that even a small... This is where Rebbe Eliezer is coming to be makal. He's coming to say that when you manufacture a mat with any, any particular designation, even if it's small, then the assumption is, is that it's for schach, and therefore it's not makabal tumah, and therefore you can use it for your schach. Vahachi kamar. And therefore the meaning is as follows. Machatzeles, and we're just at the very now top of Dav Chafam and Aleph. Machatzeles hakanim gedola, when you have a large mat, that if it's made specifically with it, with the, in the manufacturing specifically made in mind for sleeping, so like you put a label on it, it says made in China for sleeping, right? So then the halacha is it's makabal tuma because it's been designated as a kli, as a utensil like a bed, and therefore you can't use it for schach. Taima da asa l'shchiva hastama nasa kimisha asa l'sichuch. I'm sorry, shasa l'sichuch, and therefore misachachimba. But if it's that's the only if it's particularly designated, specifically designated for a mat. For, for sleeping. But if it's not designated for anything, so then it's it's as if the Tanakama says that it's made for schach and therefore you could use it for schach. So that's all talking only about a large mat. Only a large mat can you assume that it's for schach. But if it's a small mat, then if it's made stam, the Tanakama holds it, you have to assume that it's for sleeping and therefore... <coughs> Therefore, you can't use it for schach. It's makabel tuma. Ve'asa Rabbi Eliezer lemeimar echas ketana ve'echas gedola stama kishere lesichach. And Rabbi Eliezer is coming to be makel, and he's coming to suggest that no, even a small mat, if it doesn't have any particular designation, is assumed that it's not meant for sleeping, and therefore you could use it for schach. Amar leabaye ihachi Rabbi Eliezer Omer echas ketana ve'echas gedola echas gedola ve'echas ketana mi boilei. Abaya says, according to you, Rava, that Rabbi Eliezer is coming to be lenient and say, not only is, not only is a large mat uh, assumed to be for schach, but even a small mat is assumed to be for schach. So then Rabbi Eliezer shouldn't have said, echas ketana ve echas gedola. He should have said, echas gedola ve echas ketana. He should have said, not only is a large mat assumed for schach, but even a small mat is assumed for schach. That would have been the proper language. And Rashi just goes into a number of different proof texts to demonstrate that when you're using this language of echas this and echas that, it's not only this, but even that. And that would have been the proper way for the, for the Mishnah to speak. 
Vaod ki pligi bigadola hu de pligi. Verebi Eliezer lechomra? Question mark. And furthermore, you mean to tell me that uh, that. I'm sorry, Kipligi Bigadolu de Pligi Verlezer Lechumra, exclamation point, sorry. And, and furthermore, you can't tell me that the Machlokas is with a small mat. I will show you with the following Brysa that their argument is regarding a large mat that is made stomach that was without designation. And Rabbi Eliezer is Machmir, de Tanya, as the Brysa says, Machatzele Sakanim Bigadolu Misachachinba, that when you have a large mat, you're allowed to use it as schach. And Rabbi Eliezer, Omer, im eina mekabeles tuma mesachachin ba. And Rabbi Eliezer says, no, that's only true if it's not mekabel tuma, because it hasn't been specified for, uh, for, 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 for lying down on, for sleeping on. So you see that Rabbi Eliezer qualifies the leniency that the Tanakama provides. It's, there for you. it's clear that the Tanakama is mekel on all large mats, and Rabbi Eliezer is machmir and says it depends. So you see that Rabbi Eliezer is machmir. So Ella Amar Rav Papa Bikitani Kuli Alma Lo Pligi Destama Lishchiva. So rather you have to modify the machlokus. Really, the machlokus between the Tanakam and Rabbi Eliezer and our mission is as follows: When you're dealing with a small mat and there's been no designation whatsoever, so then we assume that it's for shchiva. It's a kli. You cannot use it for schach. Ki Pligi Bigadola. The machlokus is in a large mat. Tanakam Asav Ar Stam Gedola Lisichuch. The Tanakam says that if you've manufactured a large mat without any designation, it's assumed to be for schach, and therefore it's okay. And Rebbe Yezer sober, stam gedola nami l'shchiva. And Rebbe Yezer says, no, that if it's not without, with any designation at all, you have to be machmir and assume that it could be used for sleeping, and therefore it's makabal tumah, therefore cannot be used as schach. Umay asa'a l'shchiva de ka'amar, and therefore, when Rabbi Eliezer says, if it's made for sleeping, you cannot use it, what does he mean to say? He means to say that there's an assumption that it is designated for sleeping, even when there's no designation at all, unless you specifically put a stamp on it that says this is for schach. Okay? That's Rabbi Eliezer's chumr. And now let's go through a, different, a discussion of different kinds of woven mats. And see what's good and what's not good. Machatzela shel shifa v'shel gemi. So if you have these um, uh, uh, bamboo and gemi is another kind of reed, which is uh, Rashi says these are softer reeds. And um, how do they translate shifa? I don't. Uh, Rashi just says fawil. Fawil is. Um, is these are plants belonging to the rush family. Yeah, it's, it's the, these are these are softer reeds. So in any event, um, you can use them as chach. But ketana ain mesachachinba. But if it's small, so its size indicates that it's meant for a sleeping mat, so then you cannot use it as chach. Shalkanim v'shalchilas, now if it's made out of harder reed material, which is like kanim reeds and chilas is another family of reed which is much harder, so then gedola mesachachinba, if it's large, so then its size indicates that it's meant for schach, and aruga ein mesachachinba. But if it's woven, you cannot use it for schach. And Rashi explains that the woven nature of it is ind- indicative of the fact that you mean to use it as some kind of bed or mat. Rabbi Yishmol Rabbi Yossi Omer Mishum Aviv, Echazu Ve'echazu Mesachachimba. And Rabbi Yishmol Rabbi Yossi says in the name of his father that it makes no difference. In all cases, no matter what kind of reed it is, even if it's a woven reed, you're allowed to use it as chach. V'chein ha'yo Rabbi Dosi Omer Kedivarev. And Rabbi Dosa concurs with Rabbi Yossi. Now, Tanan Hasim, let's look at a Mishnah. Here again, we have Rabbi Dosa, but here he's talking about something called Chotzalos, and we have to define what Chotzalos are, but he says that it is subject to Tumas Meis. It can become Tomei, which seems to uh, imply that the previous statement of Rabbi Dosa, that you're allowed to use these woven reed mats, is not the same thing as Chotzalos, because Rabbi Dosa had previously said that those woven reed mats of the Brisa, you're allowed to use this Chach, and here he says, that they're makabal tumah, in which case you can't use a mischach. So let's wait and see how this plays itself out. Vachachamim omrim midras. 
And the Chachamim say that it's Makabal Tumas Midras. Now, what is Tumas Midras? Tumas Midras means that if you sleep on it, tread on it, lie on it, then even if the person who is Tame is not in direct physical contact with it, but rather bears his weight down upon it, the object becomes Tame. Now, it's very important to know that the laws of Tumas Midras are such that only a Kli that is meant for sitting or sleeping or treading upon can become Tumas Midras. If, however, you have something like a, um, like a wrench or something that's a tool or something that's a utensil that is normally not stepped on or sat upon, where a person could say, hey, get off of that thing, I need it, then it, you cannot be metame it just through Tumas Midras, just by bearing your weight down upon it. Okay? So what the Chachamim are coming to say that it is Makabal Tumas Midras because this is a type of mat which is meant for reclining or relaxing upon. So the Gemara says, Midras in Tmei Meis Lo. You mean to tell me that it's only Makabal Tumas Midras, but it's not Makabal other kinds of Tumas like Tumas Meis, where if he comes in direct contact with it or if it's an, or if it's an Ohel with a Meis, it's not going to become Tamei? The Ha'anan Tanan, but didn't we learn in a Mishnah, Kol HaMetame Midras, Metame Tmei Meis? that anything that is subject to Tumas Midras surely is subject to Tumas Meis. So what do the Chachamim mean when they say that it's only subject to Tumas Midras? So the Gemara says, Ema Af Midras. You're right. What they mean to say is, not only is it Makabal other kinds of Tuma, but because it's designated for reclining upon, it's even Makabal Tumas Midras. Now, my Chotzalos, the Gemara now asks, what is this word Chotzalos? What does it mean? Amar Rav Avdimi Bar Hamduri Marzubli. Oh, that's what it means. It's, um, those are marzublis. Oh, okay, yeah. That's, so now you know. So the Gemara says, my marzubli. So what are marzublis? I'd have never heard of such a thing, says the Gemara. Amar Rebbe Abba Mizabli. Okay, now it makes sense. Now, Rashi tells us that we know what mizabli are. Mizabli are sacks that are used by, um, by artisans. If you take a look at Rashi... He says, the shepherds use these kinds of sacks. Probably it's used as a, as a sack to carry stuff. And then when he wants to rest, he, crump, he folds it up and he uses it like a pillow. So that would make sense why it's subject to Tumas Midras, at least according to the Chachamim. But you know that Reb Dosa says that they're subject to Tumas Mace because according to Reb Dosa, they're not subject to, they're not really meant for that Tumas Mid, for, for reclining on. So Reb Shimon ben Lakish Omer Machatzalos Mamish. And Reb Shimon says, Reish Lakish says, it's not those sackcloths that are used as pillows, but rather it is actually a mat of reeds, like, a, like you know, a, a mat, a regular mat. So Ba'az the Reish Lakish Lataime, Reish Lakish is consistent. Omer Reish Lakish, Harini Kaporas Rabbi Chia Ubanov. I should be an atonement for Rabbi Chia and his sons. Now Rashi tells us something fascinating. You know that if a, if a man's father dies, then or a mother, halachically within the first year you're supposed to say Hareni Kaporas Mishkavo or Hareni Kaporas Mishkavo. What do those words mean? I am the atonement of his of his uh, death. Rashi says what that means is may any suffering that I incur act as a kapara for that person for that for that person's neshama. And Rashi points out to us that not only are you supposed to say that for your parent, but even for a Rebbe, you're supposed to say that out of a sign of respect for a Rebbe. Hareni kaparas mishkavo. So therefore, Rebbe Chia and his sons were my Rebbeim, and Hareni kaparas mishkavam. So, Shabbat Chila Keshenishtak Chatorim Yisrael, Ala Ezra Mi Bavel, That originally, when Torah was forgotten, when there was a lapse of Torah knowledge, Ezra came up from Bavel and he reinstituted Torah knowledge in Eretz Yisrael. Then when the, there was a deterioration further uh, uh, during the Second Temple period of Torah knowledge, Hillel had to come from Bavel and reinstitute it. And Rashi tells us it's no coincidence that it was Babylonian sages that had to come to Eretz Yisrael to reinstitute knowledge because Rashi tells us that from the day that Yechania was exiled, there was a prophecy that there would always be Torah in Bavel. And it, sometimes there was a subjectivity to loss of Torah knowledge in Eretz Yisrael, but in Bavel there would always be Torah knowledge, which is actually a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting prophecy. It's an interesting concept that sometimes you need chutz, chutznikim 
to come to Eretz Yisrael to reinstitute what correct Torah knowledge is. But that's a discussion not for, for not for now. Anyway, Chazor v'Nishtakcha, later on, in later generation, the Torah was further forgotten in Eretz Yisrael, and Alu Rebbe Chia Ubana v'Yisiduha. Then Rebbe Chia and his sons came and reinstituted it. And the reason this is really all an introduction to his definition of what these Chatzalos are, because now he says, V'chein Omer Rebbe Chia Ubana v'lo nechleku Rebbe Dosa v'chachamim oma Chatzalo shal Usha, that when Rebbe, uh, that when, um, Rebbe Dosa and the Chachamim disagree about these types of mats, what kind of tumma they're subject to, whether it's just Tumas Meis or if it's even Tumas Midras, it's not about Machatzalo Shal Usha, Shehein Mitimeos, that everyone agrees that they're Tomei Tumas Midras, right? Because everyone knows that the Ushian uh, mats are used for, for, for beds or, or for, for cots. The Sheltveria Shehein Taharus, and everyone agrees that the Tiberian uh, uh, mats are very hard and stiff, and they're not really used for arresting or sleeping leaping upon, and therefore they're not makabal tumas midras, al manech leku al shar mekomos. So what the machlokis is, is on mats of other places that are neither Ushian or Tiberian. Mar savar kevin deleka de yasev alayu kid teveria damyan. Rabbi Dos is of the opinion that since these mats are also stiff, most mats are stiff, and therefore you can assume that even though there's no formal designation, they're not meant for resting upon, and they're therefore they're not makabal tumas midras. And Umar Sabr came into Mikri, Vyasvi Olayu Kidu Usha Damyan. And the other, the Chachamim say no. Sometimes people can designate them, even though it's not normative, but sometimes there are people who designate them for resting, and therefore they are subject to Tumas Medras for a Zav or some other Tame person to bear his weight down upon him and be Matami them. Omar Mars. Now let's go back. So remember, what did Rabbi Dosa say? That all Chotzalos, which Reish Lakish is now defining as mats, are subject to Tumas Meis, which would imply that you can't use them as for schach, right? Because anything that's makabal tumah cannot be used as schach. So v'hatanya b'chein ha'yeh Rabbi Dosa omer kidevarav. I but didn't the previous brisa, which was talking about schach, say that according to Rabbi Dosa, you are allowed to use reed mats for schach. So how do you reconcile it? Lo kasha ha'de isle gadanfa ha'de lesle gadanfa. A gadanfa is a border. If there's a woven border or some kind of border that attaches all the way around, so that border itself, which has a little bit of a lip, explains Rashi, clearly indicates that it's meant to be used as a, some kind of utility, some kind of vessel, either as for, for resting upon or not, or maybe for a tray. But the bottom line is, is that because it's a kli, you cannot use it as chach. By the way, this can have practical applications as well for what constitutes a kosher schach mat. You know, a person can't just go to Home Depot and buy uh, any kind of reed mat. You have to know, you go carefully through the halachas as far as these issues like a gadanfa. Does it have a border, does it not have a border, etc. These mats have a sherm, I guess. Uh, yeah. The schach. yeah, the schach mats. So now the Gemara says, Meisve. Let's raise a contradiction. Chotzalo shel sha'am vishel gemi vishel sak vishel sfira mitame tme meis diver rebidosa. Now these are all different kinds of materials that are used for uh, reeds or softer reeds. Rashi explains that sak is from, um, uh, is, from is goat uh, 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 mo- mohair, I guess, and sphira is, uh, is what you get from a horse tail. Um, so these are all kinds of either hard hair or reeds that you use, and all of these kinds of mats uh, are makabal tumah according to Reb Dosa, the Chachamim Omrim Af Midras, and the Chachamim say they're even makabal tumas Midras because they're meant for resting upon. So Vishlam Lamando Amar Marzubli Shal Sha'am Vishal Gemi Chazul Kinta. So if you tell me that the word Chotzalos means Marzubli, not like Resh Lakish had said, but rather it's the sacks of shepherds, so then I could understand why Sham and Gemi, even though these are mats, they're still makabal tumah because they're usable for Kinta, which. Um, which Rashi explains they're, uh, the Lakinta de Peri. They, they can be used as trays, or they can be used as. Um as um, um, oh, actually, these are chotzalo, so therefore they're used like uh, sacks, which can be used for for holding produce. Okay, and shel sak v'shel sfira chazul gulki. 
Vitsani. And if you have sackcloth or sphira, which I explained is what you get from horsetail, so um, these are much more finely woven, and therefore you can use them as gulki and sani, which are, you can either use them as a sieve, or you can use them to hold very, very small uh, types of produce like grain and legumes. mamish. But if you're going to learn like Reish Lakish, that chatzalos are not sacks, but rather they're mats, so bishlam shel sak vishel sphira chazula parsi v'nafivasa. Then I can understand what the sack and sphira materials, which are much more finely woven, you can use those as parsi and nafivasa, which, uh, like uh, our, our uh, sieves, and Rashi says that parsi are, um, are, um, are veils that are placed on a door, sort of like uh, semi, you know, um, translucent or semi, semi, uh, semi, not, not the, um, that you can partially see through them because they have little holes in them. Ella, so it's used for privacy or, or for sifting. Ella shall sha'am vishal gemi lamai chazu. But what are mats that are made out of sha'am and gemi? These are very uh, roughly woven materials. What could you possibly use them for if they're made into mats? It's one thing to say that they're sacks, because then you could use it as a sack, like oh, to hold potatoes. But what are you going to use these things if they're very? It's a very coarse weave. What could you possibly use them for? The Gemara answers chazu liniziyasa, and Rashi explains you could use them to cover a barrel of beer. That's what they could be used for. You don't need such an airtight cover, and therefore even things that have a very rough weave could be used as a cleat to be makabel tuma. Ika da. Amri others learn Others learn that the kash is just the other way. That if you learn that they're actual mats, then it makes sense. Because the sham and gemi weave, which are the coarse weave, could be used as a cover for a kli. The the uh, the horse hair and the and the goat hair could be used that are a finer weave, those could be used as um, as sieves and as curtains. El Lamando Omar Marzubli, but if you learn that it is a sack, like a shepherd sack, so Bishlam Shell Sak Vishal Sphira Chazulagulki, then I could understand the finer weave, those you could use as um, as as gulki, which are like bags to hold um, you know, uh, small legumes. But Vitsani, so right, Lagulki Vitsani, El Shell Sham Vishal Gemi Lamai Chazi. But if you're going to, but if they're made out of this very coarse weave and they're a sack, what can you use a sack with a very coarse weave? You can't hold anything in them. So the Gemara answer is chazul akin to the peri. You know, you could use them for much larger produce like potatoes or apples or onions, things like we, like we have coarse uh, weave sacks for those things today. So Tanya, Amar Rebbe Chanania, Kishi Yeradeti Lagola Matsasi Zaken Echad. I once went to the diaspora and I found. Uh, an elder, the Omar Lee Masachachin Babudja. And he said to me that you're allowed to use budja, which is a mat, a mat of reeds. He says you're allowed to use that as chach. And when I came to my uncle, Rabbi Yehoshua, if he acknowledged that this was the correct halacha. He said, provided that it doesn't have a border. If it has a border, then it's a kli. You cannot use it as chach. Ula said that these uh, mats that, uh, that are manufactured in Mechuzah, if there was no border on them, you could use them as schach. But unfortunately, they have a border, and you cannot use them for schach. So Tanya no mihachi mesachachin babudja v'imeish lahen kira e mesachachin bahen. And the Brisa concurs, and it says you're allowed to use a budja, which is a mat of reeds, but if it has a kira, if it has a gadanfa, if it has a border, you're not allowed to use it as schach. I think the purpose of these last few lines of the Gemara is because these words have different meanings in different locales. So the Gemara just wanted to uh, clarify that there's machatzalos and there's budja, they really mean the same thing. And there's gadanfa and there's kir, they really mean the same thing. So just you should know when you travel from place to place, these are what these words mean. Hadrun alach sukkah. Let's go weiter. Hayoshen tachas hamita besukkah lo yatsa yidei chavasa. Now we had learned this before. If a person is sleeping underneath a bed in a sukkah, he does not fulfill his obligation because we said that this bed forms an ohel over him and an ohel underneath the schach creates a hefsik between himself and the schach. And of course we, we qualified it and we'll do that again in the Gemara. Another 
And Rabbi Huda says, what are you talking about? We used to sleep under the bed when we were kids in the sukkah. We did this in front of the zakenim, and they didn't object. They didn't tell us to get out from under the bed. Amar Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Shimon brings a, a, a contrary story. He says, Maisa betabi avil sherabin gamliel. Tabi was a, an Evid Kanani, so therefore he's potter from the mitzvah of Sukkah because it's a mitzvah saseh, Shahazman Grama. And Tabi was the servant of Rabban Gamliel, and he used to sleep under the bed. The Amr Lahen Rabban Gamliel, as it came him, Reisim Tabi Abdi Shuhu Talmud Chacham. Behold, this, these were Milsa Bidichusa, Rashi says. This was not Rebbe Gamliel holding a discourse. He was just schmoozing with his Talmudim. And he said, uh, he said, or he said to his colleagues, he said, Did you notice my servant Tabi, what a Talmud Chacham he is? The Yodeya Sha'avad and Peturim in Asukah. He, he acknowledges that uh, an Evid Kanani is potter from the mitzvah of Sukkah, and therefore, Lefichach Yashain Hu Tachas Amita. And therefore, that's why he's sleeping underneath the, the bed, because he wants to make room for the, for the other people to have a place to sleep. And based upon his words to us, right? In other words, based upon his just his uh, his stam conversation, we were able to adduce from his words that a person who sleeps underneath the bed does not fulfill his obligation. Now the Gemara asks for Haleka Asara. It's only an Ohel Arai. It's only a temporary overhang, and we learned that any kind of temporary overhang does not create a hepsik from the schach. So the Gemara says, Tirgum Ashmul Bemita Asara. We're talking, the only time that the Tanakhama says that it's, it, you're not Yodse the Mitzvah is if the bed posts or the, the bed legs rise up ten tfachim high. Only then is it considered to be a real ohel uh, <coughs> vis-a-vis Hilcha Shabbos and vis-a-vis uh, the halachas of sukkah, and therefore it creates a hepsik and, no, and it's no good. Now, it's not hasam. Now let's learn about the laws of ohel vis-a-vis tumah. Remember, the laws of ohel vis-a-vis tumah are quite different from the laws of ohel vis-a-vis Hilcha Shabbos and Hilcha Sukkah. So, echad chur shechararuhu mayim, that if you have a, a groove in the side of a riverbed, which, had, which was formed through the natural flowing current of the rapids in a river, that many times the river flow could cause grooves and indentations to uh, appear on the, on the inside of the riverbed. And sometimes you'll have a, a very large groove that'll be the size of a square tefach, such that if there's anything, if there's any corpse material in that embedded within that um, groove, then any other thing that's within that groove will be part of that ohel and will be makabal tumma. So, um, oshratzim, that, um, uh, so, or let's say you have um, um, weasels or uh, moles that dig holes in the ground. And they also create burrows or holes in the ground that are one tefach large. Osha achlaso maleches, or let's say you have salt deposits in the soil, which create, um, what is that called? when there are salt deposits. They used to have this in Pennsylvania all the time. When you'd have a street collapse because there were sinkholes, exactly, thank you. Sinkholes form in the ground because of salt deposits. So let's say you have a sinkhole that's created by salt. Or let's say you have a wall that's, or a, uh, a stand that's made out of stone, and many times the way that they would arrange the stone is that there were gaps, because you would have like bricks, like laying bricks. Sometimes you could have two bricks this way, and one brick on top of the two to solidify the wall, but sometimes there's a gap between between the two bricks on the on one layer, and you and you cover it over. But sometimes that gap could be as large as one by one tefach, so therefore it could create an ohel for tumah. The chain soar shel koros, and the same thing if you make a log cabin, you make a log wall. You could also have gaps in the wall. Na ahil al hatumah, that could create an ohel for tumah, such that if you have corpse material in that gap or in that hole in the ground or in that sinkhole or in that furrow, then it, anything else that is with Within that uh, uh, hole in that encased area will also be makabel tuma. Reb Yehuda Omer Kol Ohel Sheino Osu Bide Adam Eino Ohel, and Reb Yehuda disagrees, and he says no. It has to have been constructed for the objective of an ohel in order for it to create 
an ohel for tumah. If it was naturally occurring, or an animal created it, or it was done not for the purposes of creating a gap, but rather because of expediency. Let's say the reason they made a hole in that wall is not because they wanted a hole, but it was cheaper to create that gap because they didn't need uh, it was l- less materials, right? So whatever. So you know. So therefore, that's not an ohel for the purposes of tumah, and therefore things that are in in that hole are not going to be makabel tumah. So my time at the Rebbe Yehuda, what's his reasoning? Yolif ohel ohel mi mishka. He learns it out from the laws of the Mishkan. Because by the laws of Tuma, it says that if a man shall die in an Ohel, and by, which we'll read about in this week's Parsha, it says that in Parsha's Pekude, that Moshe spreads the Ohel over the Mishkan, which was a deliberate act of a human being. Just like Moshe was a human being who deliberately spreads an ohel, so to any ohel that's going to create an environment for tuma has to be deliberately constructed with knowledge. Virabonan, and the Rabbanan's position is ohel, ohel, riba. That the fact that the Torah uses the word ohel multiple times in the parsha of, parad, uh, of Parsha's Chukas, which talks about the laws of tuma, tells you that no, it could be any kind of ohel. It doesn't just have to be a deliberately constructed ohel. You have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of the hockey game.